Good morning, everyone. Welcome to services at the 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us. We invite you back to every opportunity you have. If you are visiting, we'd ask if you don't mind, please complete one of the attendance cards. You'll find those in the back of the pew in front of you. And those can be placed in the collection basket as we, as we leave this morning. <clears throat> those will be taking public part this morning. Tim Wells will be leading our singing. Harry Ogletree will have our opening prayer. Bill McFarland will have our scripture reading. John Dollison will lead our minds at the Lord's table this morning, and Roger will be speaking to us on the topic of My Life's a Mess. So we'll see what that's about. Tim? Number 276, 276. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. So praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. Higher flame than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. Higher plain than I have found, for plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's stars at me are hurled. For faith has caused the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. Higher plain than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I have found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. Higher plain than I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Prayer minds for Lord's Supper. We'll sing number 179. 179. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget thy memory, lest I forget thy agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light array. 
On the pew in front of you, you should see a little cup with uh, through the vine and the unleavened bread in it. And, uh, you want to have that handy. Uh, last uh, Wednesday, uh, Tim Lowry gave a devotional and was talking about the scariest thing in the Bible. And he was mentioning uh, the passage about forgiveness of our uh, enemies and, and turning the other cheek. And we have no greater example of that than, than Jesus uh, story of the crucifixion, you know, here he was, falsely accused, beaten within an inch of his life, betrayed by one of his, his closest uh, uh, compadres, and uh, wrongly accused, wrongly convicted, and nailed on a cross. Uh, and yet he still forgave his enemies. I, I think in, in some ways he had it kind of easier than we would in the same circumstances because he had to overcome the, the ability that he could have changed all that. Uh, here's a guy who could change the weather. Uh, I'm thinking if I'm him, I'm going to send lightning bolts on certain people and, and I'm going to target who they are and, and if Herod's six miles away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him too. You know, but um, he, he was, was intent on showing us example of how to, how to forgive our enemies and, and, and love everybody and something you know, maybe worth, worth uh, remembering today. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for the example that Jesus set and the, the life that he lived and, and help us to forgive our enemies and, and, and those who have, have wronged us. Help us live the example that Jesus lived and, and be the kind of people you want us to be so, so that others can come to know you as well and and also help us to find our way home to your kingdom so that we can spend eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The fruit of the vine reminds us that, that while we've been forgiven, if we've been baptized and, and committed our lives to Jesus, we, we still don't have to be perfect. We, we certainly want to try to do that, but uh, Jesus' blood continues to cleanse us of, of, of things as, as we go along. And, um, so let's give thanks for the blood. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for loving us so much that you continue to watch over us. and. And um, understand that we're not perfect. Uh, please help us to, to be better in our lives, to, to guide us to avoid sin, and, and be the kind of people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we no longer pass the communion, uh, the um, collection plates. We put them at the rear of the auditorium. So uh, if, as you're coming or going, if you've uh, got a contribution you'd like to, to give us, um, certainly appreciate that. We, we operate basically on, on your um, generosity, and, and uh, it's thanks to you that we were able to meet here and have a warm building to come together in when lights are on. And, also, we're able to reach out to people around the world and help them to come to know Jesus. 
and, and help people even in our own neighborhood. So uh, let's give thanks for that. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings we have in this life. We ask that you guide us and help us to make the most of those blessings and, and to know what you would have us do with it, to, to guide us to, to help others and to be the kind of people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 353. 353. Psalm before the prayer scripture reading and lesson will be number 605, 605. If you're able to, please stand. Mm-hmm. Bring Christ joy back in life, so my advice been, he will create anew, make all again, your empty wasted years. Following the lesson will be number 438, 438. We pray with you, please. 
Dear God and Father in heaven, the only true living God, we recognize you as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the Father and God of our Lord and ours as well. We realize, dear Lord, that you've created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and we're grateful and thankful that we can come to you in the name of Christ. We're grateful and thankful, Lord, that you've blessed us beyond measure and that you care for our every need. Our prayer and hope is that as your children that we will grow in our Lord's grace and mercy and that we will love one another and love our neighbors as ourselves and that we will learn to individually learn to love you with all our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Help us, dear Lord, as we live in this country that we love, that we can be excellent citizens, but also, dear Lord, realize that our true kingdom and our true citizenship is in your Lord's kingdom, your son's kingdom, our Lord. We thank you for your word that is a light and solid footing for us, and we always pray that you'll help us to understand it, help us to apply it, Help us to learn, yearn to live by it. We thank you, dear Lord, for the peace and joy that we have in this world of turmoil and chaos because we are yours and because we are in Christ Jesus. Our prayer and hope is that you'll give us the courage and the strength to share our faith with those around us. For us, O oh Lord, to be able to enjoy the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. We pray that the songs that we sing will aid us in our faith and in our walk. We pray, dear God, that our worship and will come up to you as a sweet savor. And we pray that you'll bless us as we all strive to achieve and accomplish certain things in our life and our prayer and hope is always that it's in accordance with your will for our life. We thank you for another blessed day and pray that you will strengthen us from the youngest in here to the oldest. May we all, Father, grow and know your joy and your peace. And in this busy world in which we live, may we carry out the things we need to carry out. And, O oh Lord, help us on a regular basis to be still and know that you are God. We praise you, we thank you, and help us each to understand that you know our needs and you'll supply them. Help us to ask for them, and yet at the same time, Father, help us to be grateful and thankful and receive. We pray for joy and peace in all that we do and when things are difficult and when things get uh, a little bit of a struggle, sometimes much of a struggle, we pray that you'll give us the strength to endure. We just thank you so much for loving us, for taking care of us, and for blessing us with a family on earth that exceeds our own family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verses 9 through 15. Proverbs 13, 9 through 15, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Whoever despises the world brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, but one may turn away from the snares of death. Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin.
have one thing to take care of before we begin our study this morning. Once in a while, we make a mistake in our bulletin. Once in a while, we fail to put something in that was supposed to be there. And sometimes our best intentions don't lead to actions. I want you to know that this coming Saturday, Pat and Alan Ralston will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. The 50th didn't make it on our calendar. It didn't make it in the bulletin this week as uh, we had hoped. So we will announce it today. Pat and Alan are here and our best wishes as you celebrate 50 years together this coming Saturday. And I hope I got the date right. Go like this if I did, Pat. Thank you, I did. Because I made a note that it's their 50th, but I forgot to put down the exact time. So it is the 6th, and our congratulations uh, to them. When we come together in a setting like this, any given assembly, there are folks that have all kinds of problems. Most of them are not known to us. Once in a while, they're obvious, but generally people carry sometimes really heavy loads and they do it with such grace and dignity that others are not even aware. The reality is, however, that every life has its problems. And some things are really difficult to deal with and others may be insignificant and we make them into big deals. But the reality is, at any given time, most of us come here uh, with life, in a sense, in a mess. Things are not as we would like them to be, and that's okay, because we know that God really is in control, and if we bring to the day the right attitude, uh, we can make something positive out of the mess and walk away from it better people. How do you know if your life's not everything it ought to be? Well, someone has suggested that uh, you know you're having a bad day if you see 60 Minutes news team in your office. You know you're having a bad day if you turn on the news and they're giving emergency routes out of your town. You know you're having a bad day if your sister, your twin sister, forgets your birthday. You know you're having a bad day when the bird singing outside your window is a buzzard. There's one advantage, Barb, of not having a window. I never see a buzzard outside my window in my study. She texted me this past week, you've got to see the sunrise. Oh, you don't have a window. I actually went out in the parking lot and looked east and it was beautiful. And I've yet to see a buzzard outside my window. Your car horn goes off as you follow a motorcycle gang down the highway, and it gets stuck. That's always a concern, I think. Your boss tells you not to bother to take off your coat. Your income tax check bounced. You put both contacts in the same eye. Never ever had contacts because I can't, I just can't bring myself to put anything in my eye, let alone two contacts. But I know many of you wear them, make sure you get them where they need to go. The cynic says, and I think this is true, don't bother telling people your troubles. Half of them don't care, and the other half think you have them coming. When somebody asks me how I am, I'm fine. You may say, but do you really mean it? I do. I think of the Shunammite woman. Do you remember that story? Her son was with dad out in the fields when he said, my head, my head. And father dispatched a servant with the son to his mother. The youngster died. And off she goes to the prophet. The prophet realizes she's coming, 
And coming in a hurry, he dispatches a servant with the question, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your son? What was her answer each time? It is well. Now, how could that be? I think because she had a deep and abiding faith in God that made her understand that when life is lived as God calls his people to live it, we're not insulated and isolated from difficulties and heartache and misery, but we're equipped to deal with it and to come through it and to be better and stronger because of it. I want you to know that life can get complicated in a hurry. We were talking in our Bible class this morning from James 4, 13 through 16 about how important it is to acknowledge that we're not in control. God is and all of our plans, and it's okay to plan, but all of our plans must be made with an acknowledgement that it is not our will, but God's will that must be done. Because life can really fall apart in a hurry. That's one of the lessons that all of us ought to take from the great book of Job. Job arose one morning and life was grand and glorious. And before the day is out, he's lost his wealth, he's lost his family, and will soon lose his health and eventually his wife. But the one thing he never lost was his faith in God. I want you to know, I have no clue what lies on the horizon. Some of it will be wonderful and some of it won't. What I do know is that what we make of it is up to us. Don't forget the example of Job who exclaims, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Your faith is not in the elders, not in the preacher, not in your brethren. Your faith is in the Lord who will never forsake you, who you can always count on, always trust Him. Rejoice with Him in good times. Call on Him and lean on Him in bad ones because life can get messy in a hurry. And when it happens... What we typically do is begin to question everything, and we generally ask all the wrong questions. We begin with, why me? What did I do? I've seen it. I've heard it. Somebody goes along, and life is really smooth, and there are not a lot of hurdles, not a lot of obstacles. And then suddenly, the bottom drops out, and their first response is, why me? And secondly, what did I do to bring this on myself? Followed by, why do others seem to go through life unscathed and here I am carrying such a heavy load? I hope you noticed the emphasis there was on seem. Why do others seem to go through life with so few difficulties and I'm carrying such a heavy burden? The reality is that we often don't see the whole picture. I've known people that from what I was able to see on the surface had relatively easy lives, but then I got to know them and got to know their background and got to know the things that they have gone through. And then I marvel and I'm amazed at how much grace and poise and dignity they can exhibit when life has just crumbled around them. And I've asked, how do you do it? And every time the response is, I put my faith in God. God will never disappoint. That's why the psalmist said it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. Because God does not disappoint question then is raised, does he really care? Well, if he cared, he wouldn't let me go through this. He would keep me from these kinds of difficulties. That's how people react. That's how they reason. But there's no basis for it in the book. 
God really is in charge, and he really does love us. And when we ask the kinds of questions that I've just raised and make the kinds of observations that I've heard others make and hopefully I've avoided, I want you to know that what we think to be true, what seems to be true, often isn't true at all. That there are people in this assembly that you probably don't know about who've lost children in life at an early age, who've lost mates, who've lost jobs, who've experienced all kinds of heartache and misery, but you wouldn't know it to look at them. You wouldn't know it to talk with them. What you think to be the case is not the case at all. What the Bible tells us is very simply, life is not fair. And people don't want to hear that. But isn't that exactly what Jesus was communicating in Matthew 5, 44 and 45 when he makes this statement? I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes, listen to me, Jesus says he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Bad people sometimes prosper. Good people sometimes face great adversity. Not because God doesn't love us, but because life just isn't fair. And if you want to attribute blame for the difficulties that you face in life, I suggest to you that you begin by blaming Satan, not the Savior. And that secondly, you acknowledge your own part in many of the difficulties that inevitably come to life. I want you to know that difficulties don't spell defeat. And even though explanations are elusive, the difficulties of life can actually have a very positive impact on us. And from them, great good can come. You want an explanation for why adversity comes? I can tell you sometimes it's inexplicable. There is no explanation. I think of John chapter 9. Bible students are familiar with that text because John tells us of a miracle in the ministry of Jesus that the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not record. Jesus gave sight to a man who had never, ever seen. He had been born into this world blind. That seems so unfair, and yet it still happens. The disciples raised the question, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born this way? I know it seems rather strange to ask who sent this man or his parents, but in the first century, Jewish belief held that a baby could sin in the womb. And Jewish thought also accepted the notion that the transgressions of the parents can bring affliction on their offspring. And in some cases, I think we would all acknowledge that in the latter, that's true, though it is impossible for the babe in the womb to sin. That was simply a false concept, and Jesus certainly didn't support it. What he did say in response to their question, in essence, is it's not either of those things. It's simply here that God might be glorified. And he gave that man sight, and the response was that God was glorified, that Jesus himself came to be acknowledged as the Messiah, and great good came out of that adversity and the miracle that Jesus performed. Sometimes things just happen and they're inexplicable. Sometimes they really are of our own making. 
Go back to the book of Job again and note chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Here's what you read. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? The thinking was, you perish if you're guilty. If you're upright, you're supported. You're blessed. Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And there is an extent to which that is a fair observation. If you drink excessively, become a drunkard, it will impact your life in a negative way, and not just your life, but so many others. And you're responsible for that. You bring it on yourself. There are many ways to illustrate that. I think you see the point. But it is wrong to suggest that all adversity is directly related to some transgression in our lives. This was the argument that Job's friends were making. With friends like Job had, he didn't need any enemies. But they were wrong. That's why he called them miserable comforters and doctors of no value. They said nothing helpful, much that was hurtful, and much that was wrong. But we will acknowledge that on occasion, our problems are of our own making. Our life is in a mess because we messed up. Let me stop for a moment and tell you that there is always forgiveness. No matter how messed up your life may be, God still loves you. The grace of Christ is still sufficient to save you. The church, if we're the church that we're supposed to be, will wrap our arms around you and love you and help you and encourage you to get your life back on track. Most of the preaching I do is designed to be preventative. I don't want you to mess up. I want you to listen to what God's Word says so you can avoid much of the heartache and misery that inevitably will come when you don't. But I also want you to know that None of us, and we hear this over and over and over again because it's so important. None of us are without sin. And we need to do better. And God is looking at the direction our life is taking. He is not simply totaling up The positive things on one side and the negative things on another, and as long as the positive outweigh the negative, we're okay. That's not how it works. I've never heard anybody who understands the Bible ever even advocate that. What I can tell you is that bad things happen to good people and bad people, and our goal should be to learn from those things and to come out of them better. So the question is never, why me, Lord? But it ought to be, how, Lord, can I use this for my own spiritual growth and for the growth of the kingdom? I know life gets messy, but help me learn from the messes. We can't let adversity rule us. I selected this text to introduce our study primarily for verse 15. In the English Standard Version, it says at the close, the way of the treacherous is their ruin. See, I never memorized that. The King James says, the way of the transgressor is hard. I want you to know that the choices you make do have consequences. Not everyone is tied to bad things. Sometimes the consequences are very positive, and sometimes, yes, they can be very bad. But whatever we face in life must not be allowed to rule us. God's hand and God's help are always needed. 
and we must ever look up and reach out. How do we do that? I go back to the text again and remind you of what it says here in verse 13. He who despises the word will be destroyed. That's a given. But he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. We maintain our faith in the midst of our adversity. And I have no hesitation to tell you that the outcome will be very similar to the outcome that Job experienced. His latter end was better than his beginning because God takes care of his own. But he expects us to do our part. The rules matter. How we conduct our lives makes a difference in terms of the kind of life we're going to have. Go back to the text again. Note verse 9. The light of the righteous rejoices. Who are the righteous? Those who do what is right. Where do we discover what is right? In God's word. When we follow God's word, there are blessings that we will reap. There are benefits that will come. But it doesn't just underscore the blessings of those who do righteousness. It also says the lamp of the wicked will be put out. What is your focus in life? It is hard, and I know it. None of us can go through life unaffected by difficulty. But how we deal with that difficulty depends on our attitude toward the Word and our commitment either to live by those commands or to live in opposition to them. And we make a conscious choice in that regard. The kind of day we have really does depend on us. Wonderful things can come our way, but if we choose to be miserable, we will be miserable. And sometimes the hammer drops and life gets hard, but we can still be hope-filled and optimistic if we choose to be. I like the little poem that says, Two men looked out from prison bars, one saw mud, the other saw stars. Now you think about that for a moment. What is the difference between those men? It's a matter of attitude. They're in the same environment. They have opportunities that are identical. One chooses to look up, the other looks down. That's how we face every day. We choose the attitude that we bring to life. Adversity really is an opportunity in disguise if we look at it from the right perspective. And sometimes the difficult things in life make us better in our relationship with the Lord. Bible students will immediately think of the Apostle Paul. That apostle had a problem. I would like to be able to tell you I know exactly what it was, but I don't. I do know that three times he asked God to remove this problem. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And three times God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I know that you have this difficulty in your life, but it's not going away. It actually is designed to make you better. I haven't abandoned you. I'll give you the grace to deal with it, to learn from it, and to be stronger because of it. And after three times seeking relief, the apostle came to the conclusion that God knew best. He still does. As we've said, Sin does have negative consequences. But not all of the bad things that happen to us are directly tied to our sins. 
the truth of the matter is, as you read this text and others, that trouble comes to all. I look at that and I think of Bonnie Armour, because I always called her trouble in a very positive way. Every time I see that word or hear that word, I think of her. She had her share of difficulties, <laughs> but if you knew her, they never got her down. That's what I want you to take from this time together this morning. Don't think that God is going to put his hand over you and protect you from all adversity. He's never made that promise. What he has promised is to take your hand and walk by your side through it, out it, and make you better because of it. When Paul wrote his letter to the church at Philippi, he wrote it from a jail cell. And he said to the saints at Philippi, Rejoice in the Lord always. I take from that in good times and in bad. And again I say, rejoice. See the troubles that inevitably come to life as stepping stones. Means to an end, a way to be better and stronger and more like the Savior. Here's what the text says in verse 9. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. I've already referenced that text. What does it mean? God blesses those who stay with him in his word. And there's a price to pay for those who don't. Stay with him when life is easy and things are great. And don't abandon him when life comes tumbling down. You see, that's what Job demonstrated. Life can fall apart. Things can get really messy. But God will always be there for you. Continue to look up, to call out, and to find the grace of God, the love of God the direction of God's word, keep going forward. As we said, explanations are elusive. I can't tell you, quite frankly, why some people have what appears to be relatively easy times at life and others just seem so overwhelmed. I don't need to know. What I do know is that all of us must deal with life as it comes and make the most of the day. That's what the scriptures call God's people to do. I can look in your faces, and some of you I have seen this example over and over in your own lives. How you've taken personal tragedy and out of it grown. You didn't let it destroy you or hold you back. You just kept going forward. I wish that were true of all of us. It's my hope that it will be. Learn from the people who show us the way. Stop looking for explanations and turn for the word, for instruction. Again, verse 13. Don't despise the word. That will destroy you. Hear the commandments and God will reward you. You say, you don't understand my problems. I may not. But what I do know is that with every problem, there is a solution. And I do know what our greatest problem is, sin. And that solution is Jesus Christ. And when you have him in your life and in your heart, whatever else you face, he will never overwhelm you. And he will strengthen you. He really did say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Out of that we boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man may do unto me. But if you're not a child of God, I can't offer you any hope, any peace, any forgiveness. And you don't have to live like apart from Christ. You can have him in your life, in your heart, at your side, every day, everywhere, through good times and bad. He'll clean up the mess. He'll make it possible for you to be forgiven 
and to be saved. The conclusion is very simple. Whatever it is, whatever burden you bring to this place, whatever makes your life the mess it is, there is relief in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, made this observation as an inspired author. No temptation. Temptation is used in two ways, as we've learned in our study of James, as an invitation to sin and as a test or trial of one's faith. I believe we can take this text in either of those two contexts and say it's absolutely true. You will not face anything, but in the face of it, God will provide the way of escape so that you're not overtaken. Because God is faithful, you can count on Him who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation or test provide the way of escape so that you're able to bear it. I want to urge you to walk out of here today with the same burdens you brought here, but to know now you don't carry them alone. That even if you feel like nobody else cares, the Lord truly does. He's there to strengthen, to encourage, to help and support. And I want you to know as well that we're here for that same purpose. I don't see the church as a country club. I see it as a hospital. You go to the country club, I guess, to be entertained or to entertain. You go to the hospital to deal with illness. And it's appropriate in some settings to refer to sin as an illness, a cancer that really eats away at the soul. And in the church, nowhere else you will find a cure for what's eating you up, for what's pulling you down, for what's destroying your peace and happiness. And that cure comes in the person of Jesus himself, the great physician who came to seek and to save the lost, who said a man who is well doesn't need a doctor. Those who are sick need the physician. That's all of us, and here today we find in him the help, the forgiveness, the direction to sustain us here and hereafter. You need to be a part of his glorious family to share in the hope we all possess in Christ. If you are his child, Continue to lean on him no matter what the devil throws your way, and he will not disappoint you. If you're not one of his yet, I don't know how you face life's difficulties, how you get through the messiness that is called living without him, and you don't have to. We're ready to assist you in doing exactly what the scriptures demand. Do you really believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Then come today with that heart full of faith, repenting of your sins, and allow one of us to take your confession and immerse you so that you can be buried in that watery grave. The old man is left buried and a new man is raised to walk in newness of life, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Will you still have the problems you had when you went into the water? Absolutely. The only difference now is you have someone there to help you through them and who promise you something far better on the other side. How do you say no? I don't have an answer. Honestly, I don't think you do either. So won't you come to Jesus now? As together we stand and sing. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleanse and be, and I once opened found. I bring them Savior all to thee. The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee. The 
Rick Johnson has come forward this morning asking for the prayers of the church. He's facing a very challenging time, uh, facing some difficult financial situations, and she asked for us to, to go to God in prayer on her behalf. So you ask for his guidance and his assistance in meeting those needs. So let's go to God. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your guidance in our lives. We're thankful for your love and your presence in our lives. We know that we've never been promised that we won't face challenges, but we know that we've been promised that you will help us through them. Father Ruth comes this morning asking for the prayers of the church, that she may find a solution that is both meeting with your guidance for our lives and fulfilling her need as well, that she may be able to continue the work that she loves to do for you and on behalf of those around her. Father, we pray that you'd help each of us see the opportunities you place before us each and every day to meet the needs of those around us. Help us to reach out to Ruth and, and do whatever we can to help her as well as your children, help her as our fellow Christian. Father, we know that each of us falls short at times of the people you'd ask us to be and that your love and your son's love for us help uh, helps us to meet those new needs help us to follow that example and, and assist Ruth in her need father it's in your son's name that we pray amen well thank Roger for an excellent message several announcements to share with you among our sick Doris Coakley that's Sherry Miller's mother-in-law was in the hospital and is now at home. Ray Anderson is currently at Mem Marietta Memorial. Uh, his, his procedure went well and he is expecting to go home early this week. Alicia McIntyre, uh, if you're not familiar with her, that is um, Herma Eddy's granddaughter, has been dealing with health problems for many years. Uh, I know Alicia from her work over at Washington Elementary School and um, she had to have surgery recently, and she is now home and actually ahead of schedule, so that is excellent news, and we all wanna continue our prayers on her behalf that her recovery continues and that her uh, prognosis continues to improve. We offer congratulations to Zach and Michaela Van Way at the birth of their daughter, Gren Annette. That was October 21st, weighing eight pounds, 15 ounces, 21 inches long. Proud grandparents are Ron and Kim Van Way and great grandmother Penny Van Way. No mention of aunt here. <laughs> Remind you there's a baby shower scheduled for Oliver, Oliver James Forshee. That will be Saturday, November 13th at 1 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. 
If you would like to contribute toward that, you can see Laura Wilcoxon or Lindsay Morgan. We extend our deepest sympathy of the family of Kenneth Ware, that's Carol's brother-in-law. Graveside service will be held at the family's convenience. And a reminder of our benevolence project that's underway. We'll be providing coats again this year for students in need in Marietta City Schools, grades K through six. You may purchase a new youth size winter coat to donate to the effort, or if you prefer, you can provide a, a financial contribution. We have asked that if at all possible, please have your coats, if you're uh, choosing to provide a coat, please turn those in by the end of services this evening so that we can compare what we have on hand with what the schools need and do our best scrambling to fill all those gaps. That's a really cha big challenge this year, more so than in past years, got to tell you. Uh, if you're uh, choosing to provide a financial contribution, you can make those at any time. We'd ask that you please try to do that by the end of next week, but those are, we'll accept those at any point. Invite you back every opportunity you have to be with us. We'll gather again this evening at five o'clock for, for worship. Uh, this Wednesday, we'll gather at seven to continue our study of Daniel. And of course, next Sunday morning at nine, we'll continue our study of the book of James. Following our final song, Adam Burkhart will have our closing prayer. Ah, and this explains why there was no PowerPoint for tonight. So as a reminder, this is a fifth Sunday. So we have a guest, so to speak, speaker. And that will be Daryl Haig at five o'clock this evening. He's gonna talk about Revive Us again. So I encourage you all to be out and, and hear the message that Daryl has pre prepared. Tim? Number 443, 443, if you're able to, please stand. Thank you once again for this hour of worship that we've had to come here and study from your word, to sing praises to you, to pray to you. We ask, Father, a special prayer upon Ruth as she's come forward this morning. We ask your hand of strength and guidance to be upon her. 
she asks that we may be able to lend our strength to her also, the strength that we have through you. Pray for all those who are mentally sick, those who are mentally suffering from the loss of loved ones. We know that you love them and that your strength will always be with them. Pray as we leave here this morning that your protection will be with us. Keep us safe as we return again tonight. In Christ's name, amen.